Welcome to HTCM. Today we are going to discuss a case about a 17 year old female who was brought in your ER with a history of slip and fall. Okay. Sir, on in initial assessment, the patient was brought in trolley. Uh, she was conscious and oriented. Coming to uh, airway, pa- uh, airway was plated, no C-spin tendinous was noted. And uh, coming to breathing, air entry was bilaterally equal. Normal vesicular breath sounds were here. Uh, respiratory rate of 20 per minute with saturation of 98 percent mm-hmm. in room air. Circulation, but heart rate was uh, 70 per minute and BP of 130 over 90 mmHg. All peripheral pulses were powerful, sir. So in disability, uh, GC score of uh, full GC score was 15 by 15. Pupil with 3 mm equal um, bilateral equally reactive. And uh, exposure was done, and the uh, patient uh, later on uh, covered to prevent hypothermia. hypothermia. So you have an elderly female patient that has come with history of fault. Yes, that is history of fault. So whenever you are uh, giving a brief history. You can just tell the mechanism also, whether it is a fall from height or just a slip and fall in the bathroom. So that will give us the mechanism of what all injuries were that we need to suspect at that point of time. So always you can tell a short history and then go for your 10 second assessment. Uh, that is whether the patient is able to talk, whether the able, uh, patient is able to clear, give you answers clearly. We can have a 10 second assessment. And from that, you can go for the primary survey. Okay. So, what was the mechanism of uh, so injury? Uh, the lady was uh, getting uh, down a ramp uh, in which uh, she fell down on her buttocks. Okay. Uh, later on, uh, she was unable to bear his, her weight. Okay. And she was unable to walk out. So, we are having a patient with a direct impact injury over the pelvis. That is what the history is of. And with this history, what all fractures or injuries that you will suspect? In this patient, uh, we can uh, the patient uh, is an elderly lady. Okay. So uh, there can be a fracture of the uh, uh, femur. The most probable uh, diagnosis: uh, fracture of neck of femur. Okay. Proximal structures mostly okay. like a neck of femur. femur. Then uh, intertrochantic fracture. Okay. Then uh, maybe a shaft of femur fracture. Okay. Then uh, chance of. Uh, any uh, pel- uh, hip-, hip region injury. Pelvic fracture. Uh, pelvic fracture. Then. Lumbar, lumbar spine, spine fracture because these are all elderly lady they will be osteoporotic so there is a high chance of fracture so that is the reason why we wanted to know the mechanism of injury so once you know the mechanism of injury okay we can suspect this many things suppose the same lady has a history of fall from height so then the total spectrum of our differential diagnosis what all injuries that we need to think will be different so that is the reason why you just tell a brief history and uh, why we are asking for if the patient is able to speak or whether the patient is able to give you clear answer. What is the idea behind that? As I say, slip and fall patient uh, may have uh, hit, his, uh, hit her head and if there is a chance there can be high chance of uh, patient is elderly also high chance of intracranial bleed. Mm-hmm. More than if the patient, imagine I am asking a question, you are able to give me a clear answer. Mm. What does that indicate? First it, thing that your airway is patent. Patent. Your sensorium is preserved. You are able to give me a clear answer. So, circulation part is also fine. Breathing reserve also we can assess. Suppose you are without any tachypnea or without any effort, you are simply just giving me the answer. These are things that I will get. So, without a primary survey, we can always know that, okay, his airway breathing circulation is fine. That is a major reason. Also, you will know the sensorium of the patient. We can do the AVPU scoring, whether the patient is alert, whether the patient is giving only verbal response or painful response or unresponsive. So that is the idea behind this 10 second survey. So this lady was conscious oriented. She was able to give you clear answers. Okay. So then you did the primary survey where airway with cervical spine was all right. So with on what aspect you said the cervical spine is stable for this patient? There is no issue with the cervical spine. Uh, patient was mo- moving her uh, head. Uh, both sideways nor- so by that you have to tell which formula or which uh, system that you have used whether you have followed nexus, nexus, nexus criteria or canadian c spine rule which one you used canadian canadian c spine rule so what is the first thing in canadian c spine rule uh, age greater than 65, 65. So age is greater than 65 okay. then then the next one is moving here uh, that will be much lower down uh, then a numbness of paresthesia of the upper limb there is no numbness or paresthesia of upper okay. limb or lower limb then uh, then the mechanism of injury. Mechanism of injury. So what is it? It is not a dangerous mechanism of injury. So from the first set three, you can just rule out or possibly a cervical spine injury is not there. 
but ideally you can do a combination of nexus and canadian c span rule either you have to if you go with the canadian and nexus criteria what is the problem nexus criteria we over treat it just like it has got very good sensitivity to detect and cervical spine injury but the specificity is low but canadian c span rule again it has got very specificity but again when you look the posterior cervical line tenderness part we will sometime will miss from canadian c span rule so canadian c span rule is more of a movement of the patient depending the mechanism of the patient age of the patient these are all factors where in nexus criteria you don't see age factor at all we just see with the posterior cervical line tenderness we will just see the focal neurology deficit whether there is any intoxication in c span canadian c span rule we totally will not see the intoxication part also we are not taking into consideration of any other distracting injuries so that is a basic difference so you should have a combination of both that is the best thing to have so uh, when you go for canadian uh, we'll actually we'll have less number of patient needed cervical collar but when you see nexus majority of the patient with the trauma may require a cervical collar so that is the basic difference any solution okay. okay so here ruled out a cervical spine injury mm. and airway was patent breathing was okay mm. so breathing you are not didn't suspect anything in the chest injury circulation uh, hi, uh, there is no uh, hypotension blood pressure was on the normal range there was no tachycardia <laughs> capillary refill time was fine mm. most importantly for this patient i wanted to know one more white what is that white peripheral pulses no she had come with a history of fall so what is the most important vital in this patient before you touch this patient i wanted to she is conscious oriented mm. before you touch this patient this is what i should know from this patient what is it one important vital sign we which we always sometimes miss what is it pain pain score you have to ask for a pain, pain score. score so uh, what was the pain score for this patient patient has a pain score of 6 out of 10 6 out of 10 so what have done for that pain Uh, we have given her a paracetamol injection okay, okay. so is that paracetamol uh, injection so how will you select a pain management in this case so any case of trauma just imagine trauma we can uh, start uh, if uh, according to severity we can go for uh, uh, pain management okay so uh, oral uh, step ladder pattern uh, nsids and then later on we jump up the gear to uh, uh, tramadol hmm. or picaropioids uh, picaropioids so first line it will be what nsids okay paracetamol paracetamol then uh, diclofenac mm mm-hmm. then we can have uh, ketorolac okay second line will be picaropioids third line will be picaropioids and finally you will have uh, higher opioids more fentanyl. fentanyl what be the route of administration usually we can uh, usually give uh, iv as uh, paracetamol iv or okay. diclofenac you can give im also but uh, test dose uh, the message is prefer panadol in all oh. acute emergencies okay, okay. and uh, as we move on we will come to anything targeted uh, measures we will come to it okay okay, okay. anything else that uh, we no. can also give ice compression no uh, i think it's going to be a I mean, it depends upon what case right, it is, and we'll come come back to it. Okay. Right. Okay. Continue. Okay. So, sir, so in uh, secondary survey, uh, the <coughs> patient was a seventy-seven-year-old female, known case of type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, LBBB with frequent atrial ectopics uh, on anti-platelets, had a history of slip and fall. So yeah. You told the ectopics. What's the problem with ectopics? Will you ignore all ectopics, or is there any any concern when you see ectopics? Mm. an ectopic can uh, have the patient may have um, developed the uh, uh, menopause is highly prone for arrhythmia all ectopics just one ectopic if you see no, no, no. the increasing number of frequencies of ectopics can predispose and also syncope can also be sometimes associated with this patient has atrial ectopic suppose i am doing ventricular ectopics which is more concerning for me <clears throat> so that is the most ventricular ectopics are little bit more uh, uh, fatality everything the events uh, requirement that other one mostly it will be an embolic events we are not saying that it will not cause even but it can cause embolic events also but ventricular ectopics more in term of an arrhythmia if they can go in for a ventricular tachycardia all those things so uh, when especially, you s- especially if you are seeing more than 3 runs 3 uh, uh, sequence of uh, ectopics ventricular ectopics in a single run ecg then you have to consider it as uh, significant and 
so that is her history so she has got 77 year old female with uh, significant comorbidities oh, okay. had come with a history of fall fall that fall uh, you have got a reason for fall otherwise if this lady doesn't have got a reason for fall then we need to evaluate the ectopics okay. we should go behind why she developed the fall but here it is clearly she had an uh, physical uh, trauma and she had a fall, uh, fall. okay so uh, she fell on her buttocks uh, during uh, getting down a ramp and uh, there is uh, no history of uh, trauma to head uh, no history of any ear, ear nose throat uh, bleed and uh, no history of any loss of vomiting seizures sir okay so this are all your negative history okay. sure seizures and isolated injury to the left uh, buttocks but yes, around the hip joint following this she was not able to bear weight sir. okay and uh, on uh, coming to general examination patient was a lady was a 10 medication wise anything significant and the plate is not on warfarin sir okay. uh, she was taking uh, at or was starting clopilet okay any uh, drug mm-hmm. that is a question that will be concerning for you any drug that she is taking which can precipitate some event for her and she is more prone to develop injuries or fractures mm. so why is the reason for a fracture 77 year old obviously was to process will be there so for example if for a 40 year old lady she has come with a history of fracture we can call it as a pathological fracture due to some reason she is on a drug which drug can cause osteoporosis that will be the straight away or see that well give you one more she has got persistent asthma she is was on inhalers steroids, steroids. steroids. Mm. so steroid is one thing that you can indirectly link with osteoporosis so again the healing process everything will be delayed and they are more prone to develop fracture so that is one thing again 77 year old that will not be the precipitation there will be other factors also so you have to keep that in mind and other thing is that you know on a positive side was the patient on calcium supplementation or anything because fall in elderly itself is a big topic and prophylaxis mm-hmm. or how to prevent it is another day's discussion but was the patient on anything no, no. vitamin okay. d calcium mm-hmm. any bisphosphonates no this all things is very 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 crucial history that you should be asking for okay okay a uh, patient was a thin built uh, moderately nourished woman uh, no, there was no his in, in no pallor rectus clubbing okay. no edema pulse rate of 80 per minute with bp of 130 over 90 saturation mm-hmm. of 98 and respiratory rate of 20 per minute mm-hmm. and uh, coming to local examination uh, patient's attitude uh, patient was lying supine with the arms by her side and legs in s tension and the left leg was externally rotated so on inspection no there was no any external injuries was not a no anything else other than that uh, uh, rotation and, and any any shortening of uh. leg was also uh, left leg shortening was noted okay. and uh, no deformity no scars uh, were noted on the site of the pain region and uh, on pal- palpation pct uh, pelvic compression test was uh, positive with the tenderness in the left Why hip you want to do a pct in this lady What is the idea behind a bit with compression test? Uh, to roll out any injuries. So even if, uh, when you do a PCT, what is the need of a doing a PCT? See, PCT is again one test that mm. sometimes it is not needed. Here it's a clearly, a, so you are able to see a uh, deformity fracture by the patient. Mm. It's already in pain. Mm. You want to aggravate the pain by doing some maneuvers. Mm. Anyway. So it is obvious, right? Yes. Uh, so in an occult kind of thing, yes, definitely mm. to elicit pain and then mm. to suspect it's mm. okay. Here it is shouting at you that there is something wrong. And some patient you are finding no reason for hypotension, a trauma patient, whether it's a pelvic instability. But still there is no role for PCT. You have to do a pelvic binding. That's okay. it. So PCT is only, uh, I, I will say never do a PCT because unless and until you are in a peripheral setup, you don't get any x-ray or anything. Mm. Maybe in that scenario you can think of, but otherwise it's a painful procedure for the patient here. It is obvious, okay. not needed. Okay. You can look for the local tenderness and again range of movements not needed to evaluate at all. It will be painful for the patient. So ROM, classically when somebody is asking for, you have to evaluate ROM for all the patients with an injury. But here ROM will be painful. So restrict it. So don't do any ROM. Uh, only thing what we have to do, when we see a deformity, whether that patient 
needs a splinting mm. that is the question whether that needs to be splinted so that the pain relief can be given so that is the one of the other mechanism by which we can reduce the pain so that is the only thing that you need to remember okay so uh, i'm not so what type of splint we can use for? uh we can use a thomas splint Uh, okay if the pelvis is intact you can go for a thomas splint maybe after an x ray or much earlier also you can do otherwise just any mobilization of that fracture site will be more than sufficient and uh, shift her for an x ray and uh, get it done and the movement was uh, restriction on the movement don't do uh, painful it will be painful only thing is that you can check with the other side that whether that there is any other fracture any other injuries that the patient is having maybe you can check but otherwise movement is not needed and uh, neurovascular uh, there was no uh, focal neurological deficit a uh, sensation was palpable on both more than neurovascular deficit distal pulse it's because you already uh, said it is palpable uh, that is a good uh, and uh, then uh, we following which uh, we did a uh, patient has uh, having pain we initially uh, the circulation but when uh, patient peripheral pulses were okay yeah and, uh, we have given her analgesics for the pain uh, later on uh, which uh, we sent her for an x ray which showed a uh, fracture in the uh, okay again what view x ray you wanted uh, we did uh, x x ray uh, pelvis with both hips mm. this where was the maximum point of pain Most, uh, maximum point of pain was in the left hip uh, greater trochanteric region sir uh, you know you tell about the x ray uh, x ray uh, pelvis with both hips was taken and x ray ap 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 but lateral view majority of the time it will be very painful for the patient mm. sometimes we will not be able to get mm. so if you do an ap view of not able to get or you are going to miss an occult fracture sometimes it is lateral view you will not be able to do but otherwise there is something called as a cross table view mm. cross table lateral view you can that you need to shoot from the side of the uh, patient so that you can try but routinely an ap view will give you an answer whether there is a fracture or not oh, only thing is that if it is undisplaced sometime you can miss it but if there is a clinically tantrafas and you are not seeing anything on the x-ray definitely you need to go to the next imaging modality uh, depending upon the patient's uh, pain and all those things if there it can be an mri or it can be a ct also so it all depends upon the patient's uh, presentation and also we also did a uh, x-ray left femur ap lateral view and again you can do a pelvis you rule out a pelvis fracture also yeah. spine also should be an occult uh, undisplaced fracture of the spine also is a possibility so we can do a spine x ray lumbar cycle spine you can do and rule out a fracture also so that is a bare minimum requirement so once you see that it is a fracture so what what was the x ray finding yeah. whether it wasn't what all things shorting can happen for neck of femur fracture as well as the intertrochanteric fracture so what was your finding here in the x ray we uh, the, there was fracture line between the Uh, in the trochanteric intertrochanteric fracture was noted and uh, so it was an it fracture it fracture okay and so uh, so following which uh, patient uh, for uh, for yeah they had an it fracture, fracture. what now what will you do in the er yeah. so uh, pain management is the main now, now we know know about it mm-hmm. we have already discussed regarding parenteral drugs mm-hmm. we have discussed about immobilization. immobilization anything else we can consider at this point uh, splinting uh, that is with immobilization you have told okay. so things specific skin traction skin traction, skin traction skin. okay other than that any blocks femoral uh, block, blocks uh, then uh, Hi, if it's called a FICB that is fascia iliaca compartment, yeah, compartment block. block okay with that, those things also yeah, can yeah. help with lot of pain and what are the other advantage of block if you are uh, doing any bedside procedures also it will be uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. in general okay close to manipulation the patient will be pain free that mm-hmm. is very important only thing that you need to do is document the distal neurovascular deficit mm-hmm. before give, giving a block mm-hmm. can our ultrasound machine with the help of ultrasound machine it is very easy to give a femoral nerve block but the quantity that required is will be very high because that uh, area you need maximum number of uh, good volume of uh, local anesthetic to be given so that is uh, one thing that you can try and uh, uh, skin traction yes uh, you can try skin traction it can uh, relieve some amount of pain then this patient uh, what are she has got lot of comorbidity so definitely they will not be taking the patient for next day for surgery unless and until it's an emergency 
uh, whether there is any compartments and mm-hmm. anything. Otherwise, routinely they will have to evaluate, get the PAC evaluation, pre-anesthesia checkup evaluation, and already she has got LBV and all. So immediately surgery is not needed. But uh, definitely after getting clearance for the pay. From the anesthesia, they will go ahead with the surgery. So, this patient think that you have the patient has come like two, three days, she's in your hospital. Two, three days, she's in the hospital. Only after fourth or fifth day, she's getting operated mm. for your uh, inlotocantric fracture, mm. whether it is nailing, whatever, whatever mm. be the thing. So, what is the additional precaution that you need to take care? Uh, there is high chance of uh, uh, and uh, DVT prophylaxis should be good. Mm. Given. So, so, what will be the agent that you will prefer for this patient? What agent you will prefer? Low molecular. Yep. What are the options for DVT prophylaxis? Heparin. Okay. What heparin? Normal heparin. Unfractionated heparin. heparin. Unfractionated. Okay. Low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Any anything else? Any other agents? agents that you, can been, give? you know. So we can go for low and low. This is for prophylaxis temporary, you know, until the surgery. We want, uh, what is the aim? It's pre-op kind of prophylaxis, right? We don't want any agent which is going to remain for a longer period of time, right? So, we would be preferring for something which is shorter. Okay. So, the common agents, as he told us, unfractional okay. heparin is one thing, but the renal function is fine. We usually go with low molecular weight heparin also. The other agent is fond heparinx. Okay. So, these are the agents which are commonly used. So, I mean, here definitely we are, we are going for uh, pharmacological uh, prevention only. Mm-hmm. In other, otherwise, in, uh, usually in critical care and all, is there any non-pharmacological DVT prophylactic measures? Uh, I think it's uh, compression bandages and pneumatic compression devices. Yeah. Yeah. Ted stockings are not uh, uh, proven much. Okay. You can go for sequential compression devices. Hmm? Heard about it? Mm-hmm. Of course, I mean, the other limb and all you can put if need be. Okay. Sequential compression devices are in all, or things where we cannot definitely go for uh, pharmacological uh, prevention, those will be the next best. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, pneumatic compression device, that's uh, one. Uh, okay, fine. So, this patient uh, had an uh, fall and you're diagnosed in an IT fracture. So, if suppose this patient turned out to be, you don't find anything in the x ray. As I told, what will be the next best imaging modality? The CT, uh, CT is modality which can show the mm. fractures which are okay. getting undetected in the x-ray okay and okay fine so what happened to this patient patient was uh, kept admitted on, uh, admitted kept on nbo mm. uh, surgery was done four days later four days later she is recovering well recovering Okay. So, uh, regarding IT fracture, as in the AD physician's perspective, our main, uh, this thing will be pain management and to prevent complication, whether it's neck or femur or IT fracture, mm-hmm. that is not a major concern for us. What our concern will be, pain management will be the crucial thing. If you miss an, this thing in your x-ray, mm-hmm. so if the patient is symptomatic, don't send them off. You think of the next imaging modality or get your help of your orthopedician. So that is one because they might have an undisplaced fracture and you are telling x-ray is fine and the next day they will start moving and the whole thing will become a displaced and they will become with a complication. So those things you should be very, very careful of. If an x-ray is normal but clinically there is a suspicion of fracture, evaluate the patient. That is our key message. Okay. Okay, Thank you.